Ask Joe Rogan what he thinks about the UFC president Dana White, and he'll no doubt warmly refer to him as a longtime friend and one of the all-time goats in the promotional business. The UFC gave Joe the platform to become one of the biggest names in combat sports. But every now and then, the famed podcaster lets us know some of his real feelings about the world's premier mixed martial arts promotion. This is what Joe Rogan really thinks of the UFC and Dana White. Media Control to kick things off, we have the scandal involving the veteran journalist Ariel Hawani and the temporary ban the UFC gave him from attending their events. The year was 2016. The event was UFC 199, and the promotion had something very special up their sleeve. During the broadcast, they were planning on surprising the world of combat sports by revealing that the WWE superstar and former UFC heavyweight champion Brock Lesnar would be returning to the cage for UFC 200. However, Ariel Hawani, being the journalist that he is, found out about this through one of his sources and proceeded to ruin the UFC's surprise. Dana being Dana, completely flipped out, banning Hawani for life there and then. As you'd expect, the MMA community rallied around the MMA fighting reporter and he was quickly reinstated. But among the many, many critics of Dana's conduct, Joe Rogan was one of the few to at least highlight how he agreed with certain aspects of his reaction. Ariel didn't necessarily have to break the story because it was going to come out regardless. But even still, Joe was certainly in the minority when it came to his defense of the UFC. To this day, the relationship between Ariel and Dana is pretty terrible, with the UFC president making a point of snapping at the reporter at every opportunity. Rogan has always been quite good at seeing things from two different perspectives though. And in this case, it's fair to say that he offered an interesting position in the middle ground. They wanted that, and they felt like him releasing that early ruined that for the people that read his article. And I see their point of view. I see their perspective, and I also see their perspective as a private company. Now, people are saying that he's just doing his job and it's just journalism. Folks, this, this is not hidden information. This is not stuff that wasn't going to come out for sure in a couple hours. He knew it was. Everybody knew it was. The Reebok deal. The Reebok deal was without question one of the most controversial things the UFC have done in this modern era. After years upon years of allowing their fighters to not only personalize their own fight shorts, but to cover them in sponsors that would help them bring in alternative streams of income, the UFC, all of a sudden, decided to take a hefty yearly sum from Reebok and bring in strictly enforced UFC fight kits. This meant that every fighter from the champion of the world to the opener of the prelims was no longer able to earn extra money for sponsors that would appear on their shorts. Instead, the UFC were offering up set bonuses for each card, based on a fighter's amount of appearances inside the octagon. These bonuses ranged from laughably small to a mere $40,000 for some of the sport's most recognizable champions. And though Rogan will always be careful not to criticize the UFC too heavily on his podcast, this time around, he made it perfectly clear that the Reebok deal was hurting their fighters, and that a champion of the world should be able to take home far more than $40,000 for wearing the Reebok kit. This is a big deal right now in MMA that Reebok is the official sponsor uh, for the UFC. Fighters can't have independent sponsors when they walk into the cage now, and financially it seems to be uh, a huge disaster for the fighters. Well, the, even the champs get forty grand. The champs, the best guys in the world, get forty grand. It's, uh, that doesn't seem like enough to me. Even nowadays, with the introduction of the Venom deal, the money that fighters are taking home has only slightly increased. Joe has always been pretty good at highlighting how ridiculous this actually is. And to his credit, it's not like he needed to say anything in the first place. Though his hands are tied from time to time, Joe Rogan is clearly someone who would rather see the fighters treated a lot better than they currently are. Underhanded tactics? A more recent entry comes in next, as Joe reacted to the news that the top lightweight contender Islam Makachev would not be getting the next shot at UFC Gold after he turned down a short notice matchup against Rafael dos Anjos. Islam was fresh off of a dominant victory over Bobby Green, a fight he took on short notice to do a real solid for the UFC. But even with that being the case, Dana and his team seemingly opted to punish Makachev for declaring interest in the fight before then pulling his interest. According to the UFC boss, Makachev will now have to reschedule his matchup against Benil Dariush to be considered for a title shot. Seems a bit harsh, right? Well, Joe Rogan was among the first to publicly throw out the idea that the UFC were actually looking to pave the way for Conor McGregor to instantly get a shot at UFC gold when he returns from his injury. And without sounding too conspirational, Joe makes a pretty interesting point. If Dana said that, that Makachev now has to fight Benil Darius before he can fight for the title. I think that sets up a Conor fight. I think that might be why he well, did it. But that's probably why. That's Let's probably be honest, why he really did it. Because Conor was at Bellator last Friday mm -hmm. and he did an interview and he said, yeah, I think I'm coming back and fighting for the belt. And it's kind of crazy. Though Gaethje is next in line for the champion Charles Oliveira, 
With Islam hovering around that number one contender spot, that would mean that the sport's biggest cash cow would be forced to wait before getting the title shot he has demanded. And for the UFC, kicking Islam to one side over some trumped up charges makes all the sense in the world if it guarantees them another UFC title fight involving McGregor. Sure, Rogan works for the company, but even with that being the case, he's never too afraid to speak his mind when it comes to the UFC's practices. Remember, if you're enjoying our content and want to see more, be sure to leave a like before subscribing to the channel so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Fighter Pay One area that has been a constant source of discussion in MMA circles in recent times is the massive disparity in athlete pay within the sport when compared to boxing and other major sporting bodies. It's a complicated subject, so we won't bore you with the details, but basically, the UFC don't come close to giving the same percentage of their revenue to the fighters as the NBA, the NFL, the NHL, and the entire upper-tier sport of boxing does. And even with the Conor McGregor's, Israel Adesanya's, and John Jones of the world, there's an argument to be made that they are as underpaid as anyone, relative to how much money they make for the company. And for Joe, who has always welcomed fighter pay as a topic of conversation, he does express just how unfortunate it is that these fighters aren't making way more money than they are. But given that he doesn't want to be drawn into insulting his boss, Joe does make a U-turn and speak about the COVID-19 pandemic and how that has affected companies all across the board. So this is why I think they're complaining about fighter pay. I think they should get paid more. Right. I think everybody should get paid more. I'm right. thinking it's a crazy way to make a living. I think you should get the most amount of money you could possibly get. Yep. But it's also a business. And I think that if they are struggling as much as I think they are, mm. I, I don't talk finances with them, but I know that WME, people who own it, yeah. they're hurt yeah. bad. They're yeah. laying people off. Yeah. Most businesses are hurting. It's it, in all the entertainment business. That's what I think. In reality, the two conversations are completely separate, but even still, it's good to see that Rogan is at least willing to highlight this major issue for the sport on his massive platform. With fighters like Francis Ngannou openly making a stand against the promotion, you do get the sense that things are looking up as far as this future prospects for these fighters are concerned. His UFC start Joe Rogan's rise into his role as the UFC's most recognizable commentator is actually quite the story. Sure, he and the company have probably had their bumpy moments over the years, but when Rogan speaks about his earliest days with the UFC, his tone is generally one of immense gratitude. Basically, Rogan was an avid martial artist and television show celebrity, and the UFC was a young new upstart in the world of combat sports. Seeing the potential in this young new acquisition, Rogan was given work as a cage-side media member, where he interviewed the fighters. However, because of the company's precarious financial situation at the time, Joe was paid in free tickets for his friends. And believe it or not, this went on for quite some time until Dana White finally bit the bullet and offered him a legitimate contract with some actual money. Safe to say, the story seems to still hold a special place in his heart, and he's always ready to give Dana and the UFC some serious credit with boosting his career whenever the opportunity comes. I, <laughs> they didn't give me any instruction. Nobody told me what to do. Nobody told me how to do it. Nobody told me shit. They just said, do you want a gig interviewing the fighters after the fights? I was like, sure. Could you even imagine a UFC without Joe Rogan sitting cage side? Without his memorable quips and quick thinking? Well, it's pretty clear that both parties managed to reap the rewards of his relationship. And though he isn't quite as active as he used to be, it will truly be a sad day when Joe Rogan finally hangs up his headphones and walks away from the microphone for good. Dana's gambling. One of the primary sources of Dana White's gossip is, of course, his longtime friend Joe Rogan. There's a real energy to Rogan when he speaks about White's prowess as a gambler specifically on the blackjack tables. Apparently, Dana was so damn good that casinos all over Las Vegas began to ban him from playing at their tables. So Dana, in turn, decided to pull the UFC out of their venues. And for Rogan, who clearly finds the whole thing just as hilarious as most of you will, whenever the opportunity comes up, he will tell whoever his guest is about just how crazy good Dana White is at gambling, quoting figures direct from the source and everything. Often, Dana would manage to lose, in just one night, what most people wouldn't make as a salary in 20 years. Here's what's interesting though, if you win, they ban you. Like my friend <laughs> right. Dana, like how is that if you legal? lose, they Dana, right White, home. Dana White is a notorious gambler, but he wins millions of dollars sometimes. He's wow. won, I think he said he lost as much as $1 million and he's won as much as $7 million in a night. Wow. Oh. Safe to say, there are a few people, if any, within the world of mixed martial arts who are quite as good as Joe at painting a picture of what a night out on the town with the UFC president would be like. And from what we gather, we'd have no chance of affording it, that's for sure. 
The UFC's Price Tag When the UFC was sold to WME IMG in 2017, the sporting world were left in a state of total shock over the truly ridiculous $4.2 billion valuation the company had managed to get. Many people, including Conor McGregor himself, believed that it was the influence and massive crossover appeal of the Irishman that helped to bolster these numbers. And in truth, WME IMG managed to do pretty well with their investment because, as we can all see, the UFC has never been closer to mainstream acceptance joining some of the world's biggest sports as regulars on ESPN and other major channels. But according to Joe Rogan, William Morris Endeavor probably overpaid for the product that they eventually got. Though $4.2 billion was the number agreed upon, Joe reckons the actual valuation of the company was somewhere closer to $2.5 million, putting it down to the superb business savvy of Lorenzo and Frank Fertitta, as well as Dana White, of course. Well, it's also the, the issue is the price. They had to pay $4 billion <laughs> for something that's probably worth two. half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'm not a business person. No, but but, but again, it seems like a lot. How did of money. it? How did it get? You know, how did it get to that Lorenzo. point where they exactly? <laughs> Rogan just seemed to be genuinely happy that the guys who brought him into the wild world of MMA have been adequately compensated for their work over the years, given his own success as of late, especially with the truly massive Spotify deal that will see him net $100 million over the coming years. It's clear to see that the Fertitta's influence has rubbed off on their longtime color commentator. And that will just about do it for this video. But what's your own personal take on Dana White and the UFC? Again, if you enjoyed today's video and want to see more, be sure to leave a like before subscribing to the channel so you can stay up to date with all of our latest uploads. Thanks for watching.